Welcome to the Road to Carbon Zero event, part of the Manchester Science Festival produced by our Science and Industry Museum in Manchester. I'm Julia Knights, Deputy Director of the Science Museum in London, part of our Science Museum group. In this event, chaired by our museum explainer, Joe Daniels, Professor Miles Allen from the University of Oxford explains what climate change is all about, shares his ideas for a carbon take-back obligation and highlights how this could help the UK to deliver net zero by 2050. I'm especially thrilled to welcome members of the Manchester Science Festival Young People Panel. You will be asking their questions to Professor Allen. Thanks for joining us and now I'm delighted to hand over to our museum explainer, Joe Daniels. Joe. Thank you, Julia. Hello, and a very warm welcome to this online talk event for Manchester Science Festival. Uh, before we get started, uh, there are live subtitles for this event, and you can access these by clicking on the closed caption uh, icon, and you can find that at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. It will be next to the gear symbol. Um, now, in response to these unusual times, we will be making a little bit of history today as the festival programme goes online for the first time ever. Now, this year, the themes of the festival are fighting climate change and ideas for a better world. And today's talk event is the road to carbon zero. My name is Joe Daniels. I'm an explainer at the Science and Industry Museum in Manchester. And today I'm going to be speaking with Professor Miles Allen. He is Professor of Geosystem Science at the University of Oxford and Director of the Oxford Net Zero Initiative. So hello, Miles. Hello. Uh, it's, Very nice it's to great see you to all. have you with us. Yeah, it's great to have you with us today. Now, um, as you heard uh, in our introduction, we'll be talking about climate change, uh, why carbon zero matters, and about Miles, uh, his work on the carbon take back obligation. Plus, we will be demystifying a few phrases and ideas along the way. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce Ella, Mahala and Nayan uh, from the Manchester Science Festival Young People Panel. Now, they are a team of budding Greater Manchester researchers and curators. They have been working across the festival, representing the voices and interests of young people, contributing to what the theme of our festival might mean for Manchester. Today, Pro Professor Allen will be responding to some of their questions throughout the talk. There'll be lots of opportunity for you to join in from home as well. So uh, we'd love to hear what, you, what you're, you're thinking and you can get involved by joining us on slido.com. Uh, so if you go to slido.com and enter the event code hashtag RCZ, you can join in there. You'll be able to vote in a poll that we are running and we'd like to start actually by getting your thoughts on this. So which one word best describes what climate change means to you. We'll be updating you throughout with poll results and with what you, our audience is saying. So once again, go to slido.com and use the event code hashtag RCZ to join in. And remember, you can turn on the live subtitling uh, using the closed caption icon and you can find that at the bottom of the video. But now I'd like to introduce uh, Miles, who's going to be speaking to us today uh, about Carbon Zero. Uh, so Miles, I hope you're doing well today. Great, thanks, yes. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you're very welcome. It's great to have you with us. Um, now, we've got a lot to talk about today uh, and hopefully we can get through everything, but I'd like to start, if we can, by just demystifying a few phrases and words. Now, we've already, talked about climate change, we've mentioned that. Climate is often wrongly confused with weather. Now, if I were to explain the difference between the two, I would say looking at weather, looking at the weather helps you decide what clothes to wear today. But thinking about the climate helps you put together a collection of clothes that you're gonna need for the year, 
basically what's in your wardrobe. Now, I know that's a bit of a simple uh, simplification there, but is that a helpful way to think of the difference between weather and climate? What do you think? That's a, that's a, that's a great explanation. Um, I can see why you're called an explainer. In fact, I, I feel I should be called an explainer too. That's kind of my job. Um, so yes, absolutely. The, the, the climate is the weather we get on average over several years or over, over, over decades even. And one of the things about actually, and one of the challenges we have as climate scientists today is our climate is actually changing so fast that it's actually quite difficult to work out what it is at any given time. Because if we look back at the past two or three decades, we're already out of date. So, you know, there's a lot of science goes down into separating out weather and climate, but you're absolutely right. The fundamental idea is that the weather is, if you like, whether you get, if you, if you if, imagine a loaded dice, if you roll a loaded dice, you might get a six, you might not. But whether you get a six in any given roll, that's the weather. But how many sixes you get on average, that's the climate. Right. Fun yeah, fantastic. So it's it's the it's the the pattern of weather that we're seeing over many years, isn't it? Really. Uh, yeah, and of course we are loading the dice. You know, the, the crucial thing about climate change is we are steadily loading the dice in favour of some kinds of weather events and away from others. So with with climate change, we can expect to see uh, uh, the greater chance of more extreme weather, uh, things like that happening. Well, some kinds of more extreme weather, yes. I mean, so the, for example, the recent floods we had in Cumbria uh, back in, in 2009, we had what was called a one in a thousand year flood in Cumbria. And then we had it again in 2015 and then again in 2019. So, um, you know, somebody should smell a rat at that point. And it's true it, that these kind of events are becoming more frequent. But it's important to remember also other kinds of events are becoming less frequent as well. So, you know, winters like the winter of 1963, you know, we haven't seen one of those for a while, and there's a reason for that. So, the, the, well, we're going to get to that, of course, and um, I think I'm going to mention something now that's going to tie into that. So we talk about climate change. Uh, we mention phrases like greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. So uh, briefly, could I ask you to explain, are those the same thing? And what role do they play in climate change? Well, carbon dioxide's by far the most important greenhouse gas that we're affecting with human activity. Um, the most important greenhouse gas of all, in fact, for the for the natural climate is water vapour, because there's so much water vapour in the atmosphere. But we don't affect water vapour levels directly because you know, the whole water cycle moves water vapor around naturally so what we do directly to water vapor doesn't make that much difference but carbon dioxide is by far the most important greenhouse gas that we affect directly by putting more of it in the atmosphere and the other two big ones in order would be methane and nitrous oxide but they're you know respectively 20 percent and then you know a couple of percent compared to the to the to the effect of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is 80, 85 percent of the so of the warming that we've seen so far is due to uh, carbon dioxide. And it should be said, of course, as well, that these 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 are gases that naturally occur in the atmosphere. And um, it's 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 really so we're focusing on carbon dioxide because that's the thing that that maybe is most directly influenced by human activity, industry and things like that. And that's the thing that we hope to be able to influence in the future as well in a positive way. Yeah, well, carbon dioxide does occur naturally in the atmosphere and, and also the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has varied over the history of this planet. There have been periods in the past where we've had carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere that are quite a bit higher than even they are at the moment. And those periods were associated with very, very warm temperatures. I mean, think, you know, the time of the dinosaurs, um, carbon dioxide levels were higher. We had a very different planet. Uh, but that was, you know, many, many millions of years ago, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago in, in, in some, the, the, the highest carbon dioxide um, uh, times occurred. And what's, what's different now is that in, in, in nature, carbon has been exchanged between what we call the geosphere, the, the, the rocks 
the 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 earth's the, the the under the earth's surface and the atmosphere only very very slowly over sort of millions right. of years now yeah. what's happening and what's a bit sort of alarming is we are taking it out of rocks and turning it into atmosphere at an absolutely unprecedented rate so that that brings us quite nicely uh, uh, to the idea of fossil fuels. We haven't mentioned that so far, but of course that's key, isn't it? When you when you talk about moving carbon out of the geosphere, moving carbon out of the rocks that form uh, the Earth. Um, so fossil fuels. If we could just just talk about that briefly, because it's it's in, in, incredibly important to to make sure we all understand what we're talking about there. So when I when I when I hear the word fossil, I think of dinosaurs, I think of Jurassic Park. Um, but why do we use the word fossil in that context in fossil fuels? And um, what are fossil fuels and, and why are they such a problem? Well, I mean, they're a, they're a problem because they're so useful, which is important for people to remember. And the, the you know, they're aptly called fossil because coal is trees that by and large, uh, died, fell over into swamps many, many uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, at a time when there was a lot more carbon in the atmosphere, and then, you know, was compressed under layers of sediment above it, and effectively fossilized into coal. Um, oil is the same kind of process, but marine, marine organisms going through the same process, um, falling to the bottom of the ocean, having other mud layers on top of it, getting compressed, and eventually turned into just under the action of a very high pressure under the Earth's surface, being turned into the hydrocarbons that we pump up and use to fuel our, our planes and our, our, our cars and so on. So, so the, the, they're, they're aptly called fossil, and the reason they're so useful is they're an incredibly dense form of energy. They're quite, they're, they're very easy to use. They're easy to release the energy from them. And that's why when when we in Britain, in fact, a lot of it happened around Manchester, the, the Industrial Revolution really took off in that part of the world because people suddenly discovered they were literally sitting on a fantastic energy source. Yeah, yeah. it's actually it's, it's very interesting you raise that because that's one of the themes of uh, the Science and Industry Museum is that from you know, from 1830 and onwards, we've got this huge explosion of the industrial world and harnessing that energy potential that we find in that fossil fuel coal. And I think what's been really great there is that you've, you've, you've tied all the threads together that carbon dioxide is driving climate change and carbon dioxide is being released by the use of fossil fuels. And that you also mentioned as well that fossil fuels are still incredibly important. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I mean, that's what people need to appreciate is that 85% of the energy we use in the world today still comes from fossil sources. So that, that's looking over the world as a whole. In Britain, we've, we've actually done, a, a, well, we can argue about whether it was a good job or not good enough, but well, I'm sure we'll come on to that. But um, we, we've actually managed to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, certainly in the electricity supply, um, quite substantially over the past couple of decades. But over the world as a whole, uh, we are still very dependent on fossil fuels to provide our energy. And, and that, of course, is the heart of the problem. That, that has come down a little bit. It was 87% in 1990. It's 85% today. You know, that, that's the kind of rate of progress we're making as a, as a, as a world. And that's really yeah. important to appreciate how hard it is to move on yeah. from using fossil fuels. Well, we're actually going to um, we're going to come to that a, a bit later in the conversation, I hope, as well, because it, obviously it's it's never far from the news. But um, uh, in the last couple of weeks, it's been a very topical uh, subject, uh, coal, etc. Um, I'd just like to uh, just touch back on um, the contributions we're getting from our audience. Um, just a reminder, everybody, uh, you can uh, join in uh, from home uh, if you go to slido.com and event, uh, enter the event code, hashtag RCZ. Uh, you can tell us uh, what you think about this. Which one word best describes what climate change means to you? We've had quite a lot of a response, uh, actually, Miles, as well. Um, we've got uh, a great diversity of opinion here, lots of different ideas, but there's been a few words that are um, coming through 
wouldn't say in the majority, but the, uh, we've got uh, a lot of people uh, highlighting the word worry. So it's certainly a worry for people, urgent as well, disaster um, and future. Uh, but there's, 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 there's lots of different uh, responses to this. Um, future and worry uh, are coming up. What, what would be your response to, to that, Miles, um, in terms of the words that are coming through? Um, I, 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 first of all, climate change is not about the future. It's happening now. It's already happening. That's, I'm sure that wasn't what people meant when they, but can I just pick up on that word and really emphasize this point? We've already warmed the planet by the action of past emissions by about a degree. So temperatures today are a degree warmer than they would have been if we hadn't uh, dumped all these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And, you know, the, the world's governments are actually aiming to limit warming to one and a half degrees. So only half a degree warmer than where we are now. And just to point that what that means to people, um, we've warmed by half a degree. Um, thinking about it, since I started working on this stuff. So since 1990, when I started work on my yeah. Uh, PhD. So, so, you know, I'm starting to be able to measure my own career in terms of tenths of a degree. So, so we're aiming to limit future warming to half of the warming we've already experienced, which gives you an idea yeah. of just how urgent it is. So, so it's definitely, it's, it's not something that's in the distant future. It's a, it's a clear and present danger. And you, you've touched upon something there, which is really, I think would be really useful just if we can just briefly, but uh, just make the connection between rise in global temperatures. And we're only talking about uh, a one degree or a half a degree or two degrees of warming. Well, what is, what is the connection between that and climate change? I don't think I've, I've, we, we've made that necessarily as clear, but could you do that in, very briefly, Miles? Sure. So, so if you add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, you interfere with the way our planet as a whole processes the energy that it receives all the time from the sun. So it receives energy from the sun, it has to send that energy back out into space. And if you add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, the planet has to warm up a bit in order to get rid of energy at the same rate as it did before, because it, you know, we're, we're, we're still gonna receive that energy from the sun no matter what happens, because you know, the, the sun keeps shining. So um, that's why putting more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere drives up global temperatures. We're already seeing an increase in global temperatures because of past emissions. And um, the, the um, you know, the, the um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the second thing that you were asking me. Sorry about this, um, but 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 that, but that's why we're seeing um, the, the 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 speed of change we're seeing because we're driving up concentrations uh, as fast as we are. And, and one crucial point for everybody to realise is that carbon dioxide, in particular, is it accumulates in the atmosphere. So if you if you dump a ton of carbon into the atmosphere, it carries on affecting the climate effectively forever, I mean, hundreds of thousands of years. So the world will keep warming as long as we're still putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, as long as initial, and that's why we're talking here about carbon zero, because we have yeah. to actually stop dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in order to stop the warming. Yeah, well, we're, we're certainly going to get to uh, the idea of carbon zero and your work on that. I think that's really tied things together nicely. We're going to broaden the conversation now by bringing in our first question from our young people panel. So first up, it's Ella. My name is Ella and climate change is important to me because I think it's vital that we safeguard our beautiful planet for future generations. My question is, what is COP26 and what impact can we expect to see, particularly on young people, within the next few years? So thanks to Ella for that. And just to repeat the question, what is COP26 and what kind of impact can we expect to see on young people? So uh, uh, briefly, if you can, Miles, uh, if we could just summarize COP26 there and respond to that. Sure. So um, COP26 is an international conference on what we're going to do about climate change, how we're going to try and adapt to climate change and also uh, slow it down and ultimately stop it. Um, and this conference happens every year. 
Um, so that's why it's COP26. There have been 25 other, uh, 25 other ones already. Um, but every few years, um, the governments sort of agree informally that there's going to be a, a big push, a, a big effort in one of these conferences. So they, they gather together as a matter of routine to talk about how they're getting on. And then every few years, um, they, they really try and you know, move the ball forward a bit um, uh, on, on climate, on, on doing something about climate change. And the last yeah. big climate conference was in Paris in 2015. And in Paris, it was agreed that we would aim to uh, hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees and pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees, recognizing that we were already you know, up getting close to one degree already at that time. So that was a tremendous achievement. Governments managed to get you know, 190, gov 190 countries around the world, got together and agreed, yes, this is what we're gonna try to do. But what they didn't do in Paris was how they were going to do it. So, you know, there have been a lot of sub, sub you know, uh, subsidiary meetings going on since then um, to talk about the, the what they call the Paris rule book and, you know, get, getting people together on how we're going to set about reducing emissions. And then uh, this conference coming up and it'll be happening in Glasgow in November of this year. It, it should have happened last year, but of course it wasn't possible because of the COVID pandemic. So it's been delayed for a year and it'll be happening in Glasgow uh, in November of this year. And it's an incredibly important moment because it's the point where governments have to take stock of where they're, you know, where they're going, having made this commitment to limit global warming to well below two degrees and pursue efforts to 1.5. It's how are we doing? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna move faster? In order to make progress towards stopping the warming, so it's that it's that commitment, isn't it, to to those those uh, figures there, two degrees of sea of warming and one point five degrees sea of warming, and obviously the the effect there on on young people is we're talking about their futures. For, for, uh, yes. That, mm. Well, I was going to say I that didn't... brings. I, I was just no, going to say I'm sorry I didn't reply to the second half of the question, but okay, no, keep, keep keep going. Fair enough. Well, we, we, we're going to expand on um, uh, on the idea of carbon zero now. So uh, there could, there's an opportunity to talk about that as well in, in this section. So um, I'd like to ask you about carbon zero. Uh, now, we've, we've mentioned that phrase. It's sometimes called net zero or net zero emissions. Uh, it's the aim of the work that's... Uh, that's being done by yourself and your colleagues for the Oxford Net Zero Initiative. So in, in a couple of sentences, could I ask you to explain what is carbon zero? Well, it's incredibly simple in that it, we, as long as we're dumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, we're gonna keep driving up global temperatures. Now, how, but I, as I was saying earlier on, we also recognize that fossil fuels are incredibly useful and many of the applications of fossil fuels will be very difficult to eliminate entirely. Um, and you could argue, and this is sort of speaking to young people, um, we shouldn't perhaps eliminate all of them entirely because some of them actually might be quite valuable for future generations, but we can't afford for that carbon dioxide to be allowed to linger in the atmosphere um, causing climate change forever. So the net in net zero is about how all remaining fossil fuel production of CO2 has to be balanced by permanent storage out of the atmosphere. So instead of using the atmosphere as a sort of giant landfill and dumping our carbon dioxide into it, we're storing that carbon dioxide safely somewhere else. And that's what the net in net zero is all about. It's controversial, so, it's important to say, because sometimes people use the net in net zero as a way of sort of slightly wriggling out of what they need to be aware of, uh, what they need to be getting on with. So, so I'm, I'm happy to talk further about that. Yeah, well, the controversial. And we, I guess we're going to touch on that a bit later as well when we talk about what's been uh, uh, hitting the news recently. Um, so, and it's that net, the, the word net there. So you think of it maybe as like a, a bank balance. You're making payments in and you're withdrawing out. So it's... Could it be fair to say it's it's still utilizing fossil fuels, but but putting measures in place to make sure that the the carbon dioxide that would result 
uh, from the use of that is removed from the atmosphere. That's right. And in fact, the analogy of the bank balance hopefully will, will chime with a lot of people at the moment. Um, you, were, you can think of the carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere as our spending. It's incredibly easy to spend a lot. Um, and the getting rid of carbon dioxide is the, the, the taking the carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere again and storing it away somewhere else. Um, okay. That's the, the earning. And, and it's, it, you know, it, it, we have a problem if they don't balance. That's the point. We've got to get to a point where that. So at the moment, we're in a situation where we're spending far more than we're earning. So we're running into debt. We're running into a carbon debt all the time. Cool. And it's getting worse and worse as the years go on. So, Miles, to get to that balance, I, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about carbon capture and the carbon take back obligation. Now, forgive me if I'm conflating two things there, but because uh, it's it's a, it's an in depth subject. But briefly, what is the importance of carbon capture or the mechanisms of that? How could we do that? And could you talk about just briefly talk about the carbon take back obligation? Uh, Miles? Sure. So, so carbon capture is the technology that you talk, talking about it generally is the technologies that we would use to safely store carbon dioxide out of somewhere else not not dumping it in the atmosphere so actually we've got a little slide from the global ccs institute uh, which we could put up just to illustrate uh, what we're talking about here so the idea is when you in the middle of this picture there's a sort of schematic of a power station imagine that. so normally that carbon dioxide would be coming out the chimney of the power station and going straight into the atmosphere instead it's perfectly possible to capture that carbon dioxide as it is generated in the in the power station uh, purify it compress it until it's a liquid in fact, um, many people think that's that's odd because if you think of dry ice, you think it's quite hard to make carbon dioxide yeah. into a liquid. Well, you have to put it under very high pressure in order to turn it into a liquid. But if you get it under very high pressure, then carbon dioxide can be piped around as a liquid and can be re-injected back underground. So you can see here the sort of yellow arrows pointing down through many, many layers of rock back down to exactly the same rock formations that the carbon came from in the first place. So, right. you know, where natural gas reserves, for example, is a good place to put after you've taken the natural gas out, you can put carbon dioxide back in. So this is a technology and this is just sort of one way of doing it. But basically, there's a sort of general raft of technologies about how do we put carbon back into the lithosphere, back into the geosphere, back underground, um, having taken so it out again. And that's what yes. this that's this that's what this technology um, is, is important for doing. So we're, we're putting back what we've taken out and the carbon take back obligation is is the, the way to ensure that those who are producing the carbon emissions are the people who are, uh, are putting yeah. back the carbon. Is that the right way to think of it? Absolutely. So so the reason so, so the problem with what I've just described, you, you say, well, this sounds really simple. Why doesn't it happen? Well, it's very obvious why it doesn't happen. It's much, much cheaper to dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than it is to capture it and store it away safely back underground. And for, for consumers, people driving their cars, there's no way you could capture the carbon dioxide coming out the back of your car. So that's that pushed us to the idea of the carbon take back obligation. So um, take back is a, a quite a familiar idea for people in that if you buy um, a fridge, for example, you are entitled, not, not, people may not know this, but if you buy a fridge, you're entitled to give the packaging that came with your fridge back to the person who sold you the fridge. And it's up to right. them to dispose of it. And it's a good regulation because it encourages manufacturers to think about packaging and not sort of overdo it. And the idea of carbon take back is we should be able to ask the people who are selling us fossil carbon to get rid of the carbon dioxide that's coming along with it. Because we don't want that carbon dioxide. We don't want to cause global warming. We just want the energy which is contained in, in the fuels we use. And that's the basic idea of a carbon take back obligation. Just to, just to stress, it doesn't have to be the same carbon dioxide, of course, because you know if, if, if you're driving a car or flying a plane, there's no way you could actually capture that carbon dioxide coming out the back of the car or the back of the plane. But the company that's selling the fuel could if they needed to, if they were required to do so, they could get rid of the same amount of carbon dioxide that's, that's generated 
by the fuels they sell, and then the fuels they sell wouldn't be causing global warming. Right. So that again, that kind of ties in with the idea that it's it's uh, the net is a balance, uh, and we actually, Miles, we're going to we're going to touch on on this again. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to bring in uh, the Young People panel. They've got a, a question that brings in a, another dimension to that. What I'm going to do just quickly, if I can, is uh, go to uh, the result of the poll uh, that we, we had at the beginning of the talk, because we're, voting is closed on that now. It does look a bit like the response to uh, the issue is quite a gloomy one, and I'm sure everybody can understand why we've got... Uh, a disaster and urgent coming out there, but also the word future as well. I guess the word urgent though could be taken as um, we're, we're understanding as you know as a as a planet we're understanding the importance of this. I'd like to uh, bring in um, uh, the next question that we have for for everybody at home. And again, you can join in if you go to slido.com, use the event code uh, hashtag RCZ. We'd love it if you could respond to this. Who should be held most responsible for tackling climate change? Is it A, fossil fuel companies, B, governments, or C, us, the general public? And uh, we have uh, another question now from our young people panel. And uh, as promised, Miles, we're going to come back to the carbon take back there. This time, the question is from Mahala. Hi, I'm Mahala. My grandparents have told me about the changes they've noticed in the environment and I fear having to say the same thing to the next generation. So my question is, will it be the individual governments enforcing the carbon take back? And if not, who? Okay, thanks to Mahala there for that. And just to re repeat uh, the question, will governments enforce the carbon take back? If not, who? So, Miles, over to you. Well, before I answer that question, actually, could I just um, talk to the results of your poll about how worried people are um, about okay. climate? People should be worried about the way the climate's going. I'm, I'm absolutely not not uh, not arguing with that uh, in the slightest. But I just want to share a little anecdote. After the uh, 1.5 degrees report came out, which I was an author on a couple of years ago, we had to give a lot of talks about it. And one of those that I gave was to uh, one of the major fossil fuel companies. It was a, it was a, a meeting of their young engineers um, that they gather together once a year. And the, um, you know, at the end of it, of course, I got asked the question, you know, is there any way you think personally, we can actually um, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees? And I just turned the question around. I said, well, if you had to decarbonize your product, if you had to get rid of one ton of carbon dioxide for every ton generated by the oil and gas you sell by 2050, if you had to, would you be able to do it? And of course, somebody said straight away, well, would the same rules apply to everybody, which, which is important. So this come, brings us to this question. And I said, yeah, okay, suppose they did. Then what was really an eye opener for me was the young engineers just said, yeah, of course we would. The industry absolutely could do it. And this is what people yeah. need to recognize. We don't need to have this problem. The solutions are there. But the difficulty is no one has an incentive to actually solve it the way it needs to be solved, which is by stopping fossil fuels from causing global warming. So to come to the question, how would we make fossil fuel companies get rid of the carbon dioxide generated by the products they sell? So they absolutely need to be regulated. So it would need to be regulated by governments and not just one government, although a government can make a start on this. And actually the UK government could really show the world how to think about the end game, how to actually stop fossil fuels causing global warming. And it would be a, a, a fantastic thing if before COP26, the UK government could at least introduce the principle that by 2050, anyone selling fossil fuels in the UK has to ensure that a ton of carbon dioxide is got rid of safely and permanently for every ton generated by the fuels they sell. If that could be established as an absolute principle, maybe we could go even further and actually talk about how we're going to get from here to there, then that would be a, a fantastic example to the world. We could do that so easily 
But of course, as we approach 2050, as you increase the fraction of carbon dioxide you get rid of from the fossil fuels you sell, it becomes progressively more expensive. And that's where a single country acting alone is at a disadvantage because, of course, you know, then high carbon industries would tend to locate in other places. And so you don't necessarily get that much benefit from that regulation if it's taken in just a single place. So countries have to work together and we can work together and we, you know, we need to work together for um, to to, to address the climate issue. Um, But crucially, this is a really simple regulation to implement. And this is the other vital thing for people to realize. We know exactly where carbon dioxide is coming out of the ground. We know exactly, so where carbon, fossil carbon is coming out of the ground. We know exactly how much is coming into the UK every year. So it would be incredibly easy to impose this obligation on the people selling fossil fuels um, to, to stop those fossil fuels from causing global warming. So coming back to that, that question then, uh, it, it, governments are, are vitally important, but also what I picked up from your answer there is that there is an appetite in industry and certainly the, the, the technical side of it, the solutions do exist. Um, so- Do you know what? Well, uh, yes, I, I mean, do you know what? I think that if you asked industry, do you want to be regulated? They always say no. But if you actually asked individuals working in the fossil fuel industry, would you like this to happen? Would you like to be told, okay, now you just got to get rid of the carbon dioxide, just get on with it. I think they'd be relieved. They'd, they'd be delighted. They don't want to destroy the planet. They're, 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 and they know how to do it. And that's the, that's the crucial point, but they can't do it on their own. So some fossil fuel companies, in fact, we had, we had another announcement this week, have come up saying they're aiming for net zero, You'll notice if you read the fine print in what they're offering, it's there's quite a lot of weasel words in there because they know that they can't act alone. If a single company started doing this, then they would just make their own products more expensive and the competition would take over and nobody would be any the better off. So, Miles, I'm going to just break in there because I think uh, I should just highlight uh, um, few little things here because you've mentioned there that it's in the news it's topical now and it relates directly to what's happening in in the UK Um, the issue of fossil fuel and carbon emissions is in the news because of uh, the Cumbria County Council has announced that it's reconsidering granting planning permission to allow the go-ahead for the UK's first deep coal mine in three decades Um, so I'd uh, We've got so much to 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 uh, talk about still, but could you talk about that, Miles? There, the 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 carbon take back obligation. Um, how would it fit in there with with, with that sure. that story that's in the news? So so first of all, without a carbon take back obligation or something like it, it's obviously insane for the UK to be opening new coal mines now in this year of environment where we're sort of coming up to COP twenty six. What would if we had a carbon take back obligation in place, then the people who want to develop the mine would have to explain what they were going to do with the carbon dioxide generated by the coal they dig up over the lifetime of the mine. Now, they would, I'm sure, complain. They'd say, no, they, 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 don't, want to, they don't want to have that responsibility. But, you know, somebody's got to do something about it. If nobody does anything about it, it just ends up in the atmosphere causing climate change. And then it's everybody's problem. So um, they, if, if you required the company to get rid of the carbon dioxide generated by the coal it digs up, how would that affect the profitability of the mine? It might then mean, you know, they then have to make a, you know, they then have to make a, 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 an economic decision, a, an investment decision. Do they still think the mine would be profitable? If they do, fine. If, and, and, and in which case, of course, you'd have to address all the other issues around the mine. And it's, it's very important. To, um, Natalie Sedden and I uh, wrote something on this in the conversation uh, last week. And it's very important to stress, you know, there's, there's lots of arguments about the environmental impact of this mine. I'm just talking about the, the carbon dioxide one here. Um, but there's lots yeah. of reasons why many people feel very strongly that we shouldn't really be opening this mine anyway. Um, but on the carbon dioxide, on the carbon dioxide score, what we what we need companies to do is to explain 
what they're going to do with the carbon dioxide generated by their products if they're going to dig it out of the ground. And that would change the conversation about what these investments mean. Yeah, well, um, we could I, we could talk for maybe another hour on this particular issue, actually. It's it's fascinating. There's all kinds of things there that, that come into play. Perception, public perception, uh, the role of the government. Um, I'm going to bring back uh, the result of our poll uh, we, we're having so far. Um, results coming in. If you remember the question, who should be held most responsible for tackling climate change? 71% of our audience are coming back to us with it should be the government or it should be governments of the world with fossil fuel companies, 19% and ourselves, 10% there. Um, interesting, uh, especially in light of uh, what we just talked about there. Um, we, we've got uh, a lot to get through. Um, I'm going to bring, Miles, if I can, I'm going to go to our uh, third and final question from our young people panel. Obviously, there's there's uh, um, there's a time to respond to that poll. And I'm going to also bring in, if I may as well, just one more question that we have for our poll. That'll be coming up soon. So if you go to slido.com and you enter the event code hashtag RCZ, um, you can respond to this. Do you think science can tackle climate change? Okay, so that's the last question we have there. And we're going to go to the third and final question now from our young people panel. Uh, so I will pass over to Nyan. Hi, I'm Nyan and I'm 16. Climate change means so much to me as it's my generation and the future generations who will be affected. It's us who will have to live in this rapidly deteriorating world. So my question for you, Professor Miles, is what influence do you to feel that climate change solutions must be led by the fossil fuel companies who are responsible for producing emissions? Okay, thanks to Nyan there for that. I'll just quickly uh, bring back the question. What influenced you to feel that climate change solutions must be led by the fossil fuel companies? So over to you, Miles. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and it's partly sort of simple justice. Um, uh, these companies and their investors are making a lot of money in causing or selling the product that's causing the problem. So it seems to me to be a very simple, uh, logical outcome that they should contribute to the solution. Now, um, it's interesting that we got that response to the poll actually most people think it's the government should and 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 we as we were saying earlier on the government's got a crucial role to play here because these companies are absolutely not going to do it on their own they can't do it on their own as you know if one company suddenly you know went off in this direction it would just go bust and its competitors would take over so the government has a crucial role to play but in my view the companies should be the ones who are spending the money why should yeah. we the taxpayer or the consumer spend our money to clean up the waste after a profitable industry. I mean, we've been here before. Back in the 2000s, you know, the banks, the financial system was making loads and loads of money by, as we discovered afterwards, dumping risks on other people. Right. And, you know, yeah. what happened in the end? Well, in the end, other people, the taxpayer, actually had to clean up the mess and, and the bankers largely got off, got away with it. So, you know, we're, we're having the same, the same situations happening with the fossil fuel industry. They're still making loads of money selling a product that we, or, or more specifically that you, young people, are going to have to clean up again. Remember this, even if we reduce emissions as fast as we can, we're still going to end up around 1.5 degrees. So in order to return temperatures, and we're not reducing emissions at the moment, they're staying pretty much flat. So every year, we continue not reducing emissions is a year in which we've dumped another 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that that my generation is assuming you are going to clean out clean out of the atmosphere again in the second half of this century that's the you know that's the size of the bill we're passing on so that's why i feel very strongly that the industry that's responsible for selling the product that's causing the problem should take responsibility for cleaning it up and that's and, and th you, you mentioned the word justice there. Uh, I think that re that would resonate quite strongly with a lot of people in the audience. And it's important to say as well that um, 
you work together with colleagues who uh, don't necessarily have science backgrounds. There's uh, there's other uh, contrib uh, contributions there, isn't there, to the work that you're doing, looking at social justice and the political uh, dimensions of things as well to, to attack the problem. Um, and I think I think that's the thing to to uh, to remember, isn't it? That um, if 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 we want to have the solution uh, that, that you're proposing there, governments need to get in place because not one fossil uh, fossil fuel company can afford to do it by themselves. There needs to be a, a kind of a landscape where everybody has the same the same rules that they're working to. Would that be Would that be uh, the case? But that's right. I mean, we, we've been here before, you know, back in the 1960s, um, everybody used single hull tankers. And every now and then one of these tankers would run aground and release a whole lot of uh, oil into into the oceans. And it was it was it was a really terrible situation. The industry actually was quite happy to be regulated to require double hull tankers because they didn't want to cause all these spills, but no single company could do it on their own. So that's the regulation we have today, and it's agreed around the world. And by and large, these old unsafe tankers have been have been weeded out. We need the same thing to happen to carbon dioxide. We just need a blanket regulation across the world. If you're going to dig it up, you got to put it back. Okay. Now, um, I just want to clear something up, if I can. But we we try to bring this uh, uh, into relation with Manchester, what it would mean to a big city like Manchester. Um, it's a very deep subject there we could talk at length but i'd just like a uh, a quick an answer if i could miles when we say carbon capture that relates to the carbon take back obligation do you imagine could car would carbon capture and storage happen in manchester or would it be the emissions that uh manchester would be responsible for as a city they would be dealt with, with elsewhere I, I mean, I, I don't know where your, your power stations are uh, near to Manchester, but certainly one of the things that would, which would happen quickly under a carbon take back obligation is that remaining power stations or factories that are gushing CO2 into the atmosphere would rapidly be fitted with carbon capture um, technology right. and, and that CO2 would be would be got rid of. Um, one thing probably closer to consumers um, uh, p positions uh, or, or uh, what, what consumers will notice is that um, petrol would become quite substantially more expensive under a carbon take back obligation because you'd be having to pay the company that sells you the petrol, not only for the petrol, but you'd have to be paying them to get rid of the carbon dioxide as well. And you know, we already do this, by the way, when you buy water from the water company, if you look on your water bill, more than half of it usually is actually the cost of the waste disposal. So, you know, they know that they're selling you this water, so they know your water is going out in your sewers and it's going to cost them something to treat it. So if you had to pay the fossil fuel company to get rid of the CO2, as well as supplying you with the, the fuel, then it would could, even, could easily almost double the cost of, of, of fossil fuels. And so that would make it all the more reason for people to use electric cars or to, to, or to use um, electric home heating, uh, because that, of course, would make uh, that, that then, of course, they, they don't need to pay somebody to get rid of the uh, CO2 they generate. One very practical outcome also of this is that if you're worried about your, your home heating, for example, people would probably come along offering to sell you hydrogen to burn in your home boiler rather than uh, natural gas, because if somebody's selling you hydrogen, then they can get rid of the CO2 before they pipe it to your house. And yeah. you know you, you you can carry on heating your house um, but without uh, causing climate change. So so there's there's practical implications that the consumer would see as this policy was implemented. But no, the consumer themselves or herself or himself wouldn't be actually couldn't be actually responsible for getting rid of their own CO two because of course we don't you know you can't go and dig a hole in the garden and put CO two into it. Um, this is a this is a you know a big industrial uh, enterprise. So it's capturing the carbon as it's pro uh, the carbon emissions as they're produced at source and factoring that into the the price that would be eventually given to consumers. I guess um, we're, yes. we're coming. Oh, sorry, Mars. I was just going to say we're coming up to the end of our time here. Um, we could we could talk at length, um, but 
before we finish our conversation, I'd like to bring in a few quick fire questions, if I may. Uh, and these, these questions would range over several different areas. Um, I'd like to get in as many as I could. Um, so just one or two sentences, if possible, Miles, on this. Um, let's start with the first one. Um, bringing it back to Manchester, which STEM careers uh, or professions do we need in Manchester to help this city become carbon zero? And I must mention as well, actually, Manchester Climate Change, uh, Manchester Climate Change Agency, which are a group responsible for overseeing and championing uh, climate change action in the city. So just again, that question, which STEM careers or professions do we need in Manchester to help this city become carbon zero? Um, well, in a nutshell, all of them. Um, but, um, you know, if I could just, obviously, there's a lot of engineering involved in the solutions I've been talking about. But one thing I haven't been talking about, by the way, is the role of, of, of nature um, and, and natural climate solutions as a way of, of mopping up carbon uh, in, in, in the meantime. Um, I, I, I think we need to be careful about relying on nature to mop up our fossil fuel habit forever. Um, but it's certainly a very effective solution uh, over, you know, over the next couple of decades. And so there's there's lots of uh, room uh, room for for biologists, for, for 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 zoologists, and so on in in thinking about how we can uh, better uh, better use um, or better interact with the natural world. I probably shouldn't use the word use there because um, uh, in order to 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 maximise the way in which we we uh, encourage it to to store carbon, um, and so so engineering, um, you know, basic physics and chemistry uh, underlies all of this, um, yeah. and of course maths underlies everything, as the mathematicians would love us to point out. Um, so you know, do 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 look very hard at your your STEM careers. You're looking in the right place there if you're thinking about how you can really make a contribution. Uh, to the climate problem, but again, it's also important to, to stress. And as you as you mentioned, Joe, um, yeah, there's a lot of politics in this. There's a lot of law in this. There's a lot of yeah. you know understanding how people behave. So it's not just about STEM here. It's also about the 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 social science of this transition. Yeah. And you know, in many ways. In, in many ways, you could argue that the science, the engineering, we, we know what those solutions are. The hard part is actually working out how to get people to do them. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah, I've I've I've, uh, I've come across you saying that before in in, in other talks and uh, and in, in various articles that the science uh, is pretty much not necessarily done, but we've got we've got answers. We've got answers to implement. I just want to quickly bring in uh, something that you mentioned there in your answer, and it's a, a question that we had, and I thought I'd bring it up now because it, it fits quite well. So when we talk about nature uh, being a part of the solution to this, uh, and again, I would I would uh, just say uh, as briefly as you can, why can't we just let uh, nature help us here, and we could just plant more trees, and that could be the solution. We we can let nature help us. We should let nature help us, but we should also recognise um, that uh, nature cannot solve this problem for us, and it would be wrong to expect nature to solve this problem, uh, as it were, on its own. Um, the 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 total uh, amount of carbon that we might be able to um, take out of the atmosphere using natural climate solutions uh, by the time we get to 1.5 degrees adds up to less than a decade's worth of fossil fuel emissions. So, you know, it can help, um, but it, we can't count on nature to do the whole job for us. Eventually, there is no other solution to defossilizing fossil carbon than refossilizing fossil carbon, which means storing it safely and permanently back underground. Yeah. And I've, I've, um, I've, come across you saying before in various articles that we, we, we're going to reach or we have reached peak tree. So the point by which nature basically can't absorb the carbon that we're putting out there. Um, I'm just going to bring in, oh, if I may, another quick question. Um, and it kind of relates to this. We're, uh, if we're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, if we put in place measures to do that, could we... Um, this might be a bit optimistic, but could we reverse the climate change that we're seeing? We we could. And in fact, one day we probably will have to, because the way we're going, 
we're probably going to end up at temperatures that are higher than we would like them to be. And so future generations will actually have to draw carbon dioxide levels back down again by taking carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere and, and pumping it back underground, which is all the more reason why we, particularly Britain, because, you know, we kind of started this whole thing. Um, and it, we, we have a, a real obligation in our generation today to develop the technologies to allow those future generations to do that. Yeah. Is it is it safe to store uh, carbon underground? Are there any, are there um, any downsides, any negative side effects of that? OK, so so that, that's a really important question. Um, so uh, it's it can be safe, but it isn't automatically safe. So you do. That's another reason I would argue for getting on with it, because we need to learn how to do this. We need to learn which are the rock formations that carbon dioxide is stored in easily and cheaply um, for and, and, and durably. So it stays there for a long time. Uh, and and so uh, and, and so we, we're only going to learn by experience from doing that. But fortunately, the, the geology around this is actually very similar to the whole process of finding hydrocarbons in the first place. So partly because of the fossil fuel industry, we've actually got a lot of expertise in the right kind of areas to find places to put the CO2. Yeah, and the space, and I guess the space available. I've got a, um, I've got a short question, but the answer could, could be quite long. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a big question. But if I could just ask, uh, just, uh, just a couple of uh, uh, sentences in reply. How well has carbon dioxide, uh, sorry, has the carbon take back been received by governments? So the, you work on the carbon take back obligation. How well has it been received by government? It's an uphill struggle because I think people are, are definitely used to thinking about the climate problem in a very different way. We tend to focus on emitters, not extractors. And you could say cynically that suited a lot of people very well to turn the focus on the emitters and let the extractors just carry on selling their products and doing very nicely out of it. Thank you very much. So uh, it's a matter of changing the, the, the conversation uh, which takes a lot of a long time and it will take a lot of members of the public you know really stepping up and saying look this isn't good enough you keep asking us to solve the climate problem while these guys are selling and they're mostly guys but men and women in the fossil fuel industry is still making plenty of money selling their product causing the problem that we are being asked to clean up well uh thank you for that and um, we're, we're getting very close to the end now and um actually miles i'd like to share with yourself and with our audience the voting has closed on our final poll now and it's a it's it's a, a nice positive way to finish here the question was do you think science can tackle climate change and overwhelmingly there the answer is yes uh 89 percent of people who responded to that poll said yes with a 11% of course saying no. So yeah. that's great. It, it kind of, it, you know, it, we, we've covered a lot in this conversation. The appetite is there in, in, uh, within industry for this. And in terms of at least our audience, the belief is there as well that, that science can play a, a huge role in, in tackling climate change. Um, I just ask you just one or two words in, in response to that, Miles, before we close. Science can, but science happens, in particular science on a massive scale, like getting rid of carbon dioxide at this sort of scale, will only happen if we get the rules in place to make it happen. And so governments absolutely do have a role to play stepping up here. And I really hope, you know, people get this message. I'm not talking about something which is necessarily helpful to the fossil fuel industry. In fact, many in the fossil fuel industry would feel slightly nervous about the idea are being held responsible for the consequences of the product they sell. But they absolutely should be. It should not be allowed that someone should sell a product that causes global warming without having any responsibility for cleaning up after themselves. So that's the very simple transition we need to make. We need to call on our politicians to step up and, and accept that principle and say, yep, we get this. That's what net zero means. That's what a net zero fossil fuel industry must look like. Now, how are we going to get there? Well, Miles, you've brought it to a, a brilliant uh, conclusion there, so I, I appreciate that. And with that, unfortunately, we, we've come to the end of our conversation today. And uh, so thank you so much, Miles, for sharing your time, knowledge and insight with us. And uh, 
uh, I must say a, a huge thank you as well to uh, Manchester Science Festival's Young People Panel for uh, your thought provoking questions and contributions. A big thank you to the Science Museum's Deputy Director, Julian Knights, for the introduction we heard at the start of today's event. And finally, uh, a, a big thank you to everybody at home, our audience, for joining us today. Search Manchester Science Festival for events. And if you'd like to support the Science Museum Group, you can make a donation using the link below. The next talk tomorrow evening, Changing the System, Brian Eno and James Thornton in conversation, will discuss how we can use the power of the law to protect the planet. So again, a, a big thank you and a goodbye to Miles. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great to have you with us. Uh, really appreciate it. And of course, a uh, thank you to uh, everybody at home for watching us. Do keep yourself safe and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.